take her story of her dealing with the disease of addiction and her path to recovery, and now she's bringing that not only to our state, to the nation. Uh, the impact of her work has touched thousands of lives, and, and I, I just have to say, it's, uh, I've seen her in action. Uh, I know the work that she's doing is doing amazing things. It's been recognized nationally. She's been asked to keynote at the National Governors Association, which is an annual three-day event. Uh, we were there last year. She's the only person in three days that got a standing ovation. Uh, she's uh, been received awards from the National Addiction Policy Forum, and she's been invited uh, to serve on the board of trustees of one of the organizations in our nation, which is making a huge impact on the <clears throat> on on uh, addiction, which is the uh, Betty Ford Hazelton uh, organization. So having a huge impact, uh, she deserves the national recognition that she gets because the, of the great work that she's doing, but I, it's actually, we're so honored and so fortunate as a state to have her working right here. And yesterday we talked a lot about, <clears throat> about communities uh, in terms of workforce and smart infrastructure. Uh, some about healthy, vibrant communities. Today we're kicking off the day talking about healthy, vibrant communities. It's not just about walkability and bikeability and parks and recreation and activity, which are all fantastic to help us deal with uh, some of the chronic health issues that our nation uh, faces, uh, whether it's heart disease or diabetes or obesity. Uh, those, are, those are things that are all work better when we have build healthy, vibrant communities. We get out of our cars, we build communities for people, not for automobiles. But the other big piece about, about health and healthy communities is making sure that we've got communities that are, that are, you know, can be free of the disease of addiction, that have the right kind of support for people that are, that are in recovery and do that. And, and uh, we're so fortunate. We've got a great team at the state of North Dakota. Uh, Pam Sagnus, the behavioral health team, Mylynn Tufty, and the group at, uh, that we have in our Department of Health. But what a champion we have uh, in our First Lady. One of the things that she started three years ago was Recovery Reinvented. We had the first one, the second one. Now we have the third one coming up on November 12th right here in Bismarck. And over a thousand people have registered for it. If you've got an interest in healthy communities, if you've got a personal connection to the disease of addiction, we invite you to be there for fantastic speakers, high energy, uh, great learning, and ways to help move your, your community ahead. And it's for everybody. It's for parents. It's for siblings. It's for people who've had a, uh, been somehow touched, because we know every family, every community, every organization in our state is somehow touched by the disease of addiction. So see you on November 12th, right back here in Bismarck. But uh, in terms of the, the, the individual I'm about ready to, to introduce, she's also had a huge impact working with youth across the state, whether it's from uh, Turtle Mountain Youth Council, Grand Forks Youth Council, you name it, the Yes Challenge, the Youth Ending Stigma, touching youth all over the state. It's fantastic. We have all the students that are here today. Uh, but I'm going to say no more other than the simple fact, which I absolutely believe. I know I'm a little biased. Uh, because I have reason to be biased, but we, we absolutely positively in North Dakota have the best first lady of any state working here, right here in our state for us every day. Let's welcome the courageous Catherine Helgas, first lady of North Dakota. <laughs> I always want to shake your hand, being really professional, and then that it's kind of awkward. On the yeah. we need to come up. We need to come up with a, one of those things where you know you see football players coming off yeah, the feet, you know, or game. baseball players, and they've got that whole hand slap thing. We need to do that. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come up that. with something okay. like that. I don't think I need this, but okay. right. I know where it is if I need it. So, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for Governor for your support of me um, and yeah he is a little biased but you know it's truly a partnership that we have um, working together on behavioral health issues and initiatives and I'm so grateful for that um, <clears throat> thank you so much governor for your vision to create opportunities for all North Dakotans to reach their fullest potential thanks to all of you who are making it a priority to be here today to engage in how we can effectively develop and promote healthy communities. This morning, it's an honor for me to introduce United States Surgeon General, Vice Admiral, Dr. Jerome Adams. We share a common passion for eliminating the stigma surrounding the chronic disease of addiction 
and believe that those suffering from addiction must be treated with compassion. <clears throat> the chronic disease of addiction, including the opioid crisis, is one of the biggest challenges facing our nation. I'm not an expert on the disease of addiction, but I do have lived experience. I've been in recovery from alcohol addiction for over 17 years. Thank you. I spent 15 of those years in silence, keeping my addiction journey and recovery in the closet like a shameful secret. Only one in 10 people who need treatment for addiction actually seek treatment. I know because I was one of those statistics. I knew for years that I needed help with my addiction, but I didn't seek it because I was ashamed. And my journey with addiction started when I was in high school in Jamestown, North Dakota. I had my first blackout when I was in high school, a blackout from drinking alcohol. I struggled with addiction um, related issues and episodes over the next 20 years of my life and I, I chose to work and live in places that included excessive drinking and I couldn't imagine my life without alcohol. My career progressed and I had forward motion in my life but I could never reach my full potential with my addiction holding me back. I knew I needed to stop drinking but addiction is a powerful disease and it kept me drinking for many years. I'd stop drinking for three months, and then I'd start again. I'd stop for a year, and then I'd start drinking again. And this cycle continued over a period of eight years. At the end of those eight years, I literally thought I must be insane, you know, because no one would, you know, the, I kept thinking, I kept thinking I could make the right choices and do the right thing and, and I'm, I'm so grateful that I, you know, my higher power kept asking me to, to try again but, you know, I, you know, people who have difficulty understanding that addiction is a disease, you know, for me, I, you know, I, I would never choose to have eight years of struggle like that and people that have, you know, People don't choose to die of a drug overdose and they don't choose to lose everything in their life because of meth or to die from years of addiction to alcohol. But you know, I finally became willing to do whatever it would take to get sober and that's when a miracle happened for me. I asked for help and I started staying sober. I found a program that's built on a foundation of gratitude, helping others and a higher power and it's changed my life and I'll forever be grateful to that program and its people for embracing me and helping me find recovery. Well, my openness about recovery has transformed into my mission to eliminate the stigma of the chronic brain disease of addiction and become an advocate to create opportunities for the people, families, and communities that are impacted by this disease. This unexpected journey has opened doors to places like the White House where I've met with federal leaders related to the opioid crisis. During one of the White House meetings, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Adams and saw firsthand the passion, dedication, and commitment he has to bringing solutions to the opioid crisis and to supporting communities to be safe, healthy, and connected. Our work to reinvent recovery in North Dakota has been supported by the accomplishments and leadership of Dr. Adams. He has taken a stand that addiction is a chronic disease that requires a public health approach. He issued a monumental national advisory encouraging everyone to carry and administer naloxone, an opioid overdose reversing agent. His orders are simple, get naloxone, be prepared and save a life. Dr. Adams has been a leader in helping to eliminate stigma by sharing his own personal connection to this disease, telling the story of his brother Philip who has struggled with addiction. Dr. Adams is also someone to take the time and listen and marvel at the great work happening in communities across the nation. This past year, the governor and I launched the first ever Youth Ending Stigma Challenge, 
awarding 17 middle and high school groups a $1,000 grant to lead an initiative in their schools that would eliminate stigma in their schools and communities. And one of those groups was the Grand Forks Youth Commission, who used their faces and voices to produce a video to speak out against stigma and remind everyone that there is always hope. I sent an email to Dr. Adams sharing their video, and he responded with enthusiasm. <laughs> and I'm so touched by that, but saying that these students were you know, making great work in their communities to transform and provide hope and healing. Dr. Adams' intentional response encouraged these students to continue their efforts to end stigma and be leaders to their peers in Grand Forks. The state of North Dakota is fortunate and so grateful to have Dr. Adams join us this morning. He's leading the way through initiatives surrounding the opioid epidemic, oral health, and the links between community health and both economic prosperity and national security. Dr. Adams leads with science and facilitates locally led solutions to some of our nation's most pressing health problems. And when I asked him what was the most important thing the people of North Dakota should know about him before he delivers his address today, and he said that he's a proud father to three children Caden, Eli, and Millie. Please help me give a warm North Dakota welcome to the United States Surgeon General, Vice Admiral, Dr. Jerome Adams. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, what a crowd here and what a wonderful, wonderful morning. And I'm not just saying that because the uh, Nats won last night. Anyone stay up and watch that game? Uh, you know, I'm a little bit biased too, Governor. And uh, I'm biased for a different reason than you are. But uh, I'm biased towards the, the First Lady because she is such a wonderful advocate for people with addiction, and she's a wonderful advocate for the people of North Dakota. And uh, she does it by telling stories. She tells stories about, about her experience. She tells stories about your experience, and uh, I can attest to that. She's been to my office, she's been to, uh, to the White House, she's been all over the country helping folks understand uh, what's not going well here in North Dakota, but more importantly, what is going well. And uh, it takes courage to share stories. As you heard, my own brother right now sits in prison due to crimes he committed to support his addiction. The brother of the United States Surgeon General, and we tend to think that addiction happens to bad families, bad people. That's that stigma that the First Lady talked about. But uh, my parents managed to raise a Surgeon General, so I think they did something right. But they also raised my brother, Philip, who um, unfortunately self-medicated with alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and then he uh, went to a party one day and someone gave him a pill. And I didn't plan to tell this story this morning, even though I share it often, but with so many students out there, I think it's important that you hear that because it happened when he was your age. Anxiety, depression, didn't want to talk about it, was told to suck it up because there's stigma attached to behavioral health and mental health and wellness. And uh, we didn't recognize it because we had our own stigma too. Ah, he'll be fine. Ah, he's okay. Ah, that's just normal teenagers. And uh, then he went to a party and uh, someone offered him a pill that he thought would be innocent, make him feel good, would help him forget his problems. And that led to heroin usage. And that led to him stealing to support his addiction, and that led to his prison sentence of 10 years. So critically important that we all share our stories, because that's the only way that we're going to lower stigma. And I think it's actually a perfect segue into the conversation that you're going to have today, 
because uh, the First Lady is reinventing recovery, but one of the things we talked about at dinner last night is the need to uh, reinvent resilience, to reinvent prevention. We want to make sure we've got a supportive environment that provides treatment and recovery and jobs and an opportunity to reintegrate back into society when people fall. <clears throat> but we want to build communities so that people like my brother never end up needing to be picked up in the first place. And uh, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. The Main Street North Dakota Initiative first came to my attention about a year ago when uh, you all sent in a description of it to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in response to a federal register notice that I requested seeking information about how communities can come together to create both health and economic prosperity. And uh, I'm so pleased to be here to learn about the many different things that are going on that are looking at that connection. I visited with one of your judges yesterday who has a running for recovery program where public safety is coming together with other folks in the community to provide that supportive environment that people need to recover. As Surgeon General, I've visited countless communities across the country and uh, almost all 50 states. It took me a little while to make it out here to, uh, to North Dakota, uh, but I, I got to tell you, after being out here if even for a little bit, uh, I can't wait to come back. I want to come back when it's a little warmer, but I can't wait to come back. <clears throat> but it's important to me to visit everyone because I know that each state and each community is different. I know that what works in Boston, Massachusetts, or Los Angeles, California, or Dallas, Texas isn't what's going to work in Bismarck or Fargo or mine it. I know that communities know their challenges and know what their needs are, and that if they're empowered, then they'll come together to meet those challenges and needs and build a stronger future together. You know, what's interesting is people always ask me, well, why can't Washington, D.C. do this, or why can't you all do that? And um, I'm as frustrated with the dysfunction there as uh, anyone else is. But uh, uh, one of the things that I tell folks is when you dial 911, uh, it doesn't ring to the Surgeon General's office in Washington, D.C. Thank goodness. It rings to your local communities. And so we need to empower your local communities to answer that call, whatever that call for help is. And that's really the way I see my role uh, as Surgeon General playing out. And that's what you're doing here with the Main Street Initiative, empowering communities across North Dakota to build on past successes, create current opportunities, and embrace a vibrant future for employers, for employees, for community members, for businesses, for everybody. And businesses, they have a particular interest and a particular stake in community health and prosperity that they don't always see, doesn't always uh, become apparent, but, but that we're gonna try to lift up today. With an unemployment rate below 2.5% and one of the highest labor force participation rates in the nation, North Dakota businesses have a lot to be proud of, but they're also eager for strategies to attract and retain workers because there aren't enough people out there in the job market to fill all the positions that need to be filled. And to be able to retain these workers, it's going to take innovative strategies that will likely involve a little bit of give and take between businesses and communities as businesses work to make themselves more attractive places and provide resources through wages and taxes and to make their communities a destination. At the same time, we know that many communities out there are doubling down on strengthening the infrastructure that businesses and community members so vitally depend upon. And uh, as you may have heard, the Business Roundtable, the group of Fortune 500 CEOs, uh, state, stated a few weeks ago that businesses are stakeholders in a community, and communities are one of a half dozen or more stakeholders that businesses serve. To put it another way, they'd previously been focused solely on making money, on returning that shareholder value. And they've realized that that's come at the expense of communities. Once upon a time, uh, businesses used to invest in parks. They used to invest in theaters. They used to sponsor the Little League team. They used to do things that would lift the community up. And then there was a change. And uh, without going too far into it, there were actually economists out there. There were prominent people who said, 
you should not focus on building the community. You should focus on returning maximum investment to the shareholders. And uh, that's when a lot of, uh, I think, the fabric of our, our community started to fall apart. But they're now starting to realize that businesses must maximize value for not shareholders, but all stakeholders, customers. Uh, gosh, if you're spending one-fifth of your GDP on uh, health care, if you're trying to pay $10,000 a week for a rehab facility, that's money you can't spend on the products that businesses are trying to sell. We know that employees need to be part of this definition of stakeholders, suppliers, communities. Uh, we've all got to be all in if we want a healthy and vibrant future. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about my Community Health and Economic Prosperity Initiative. At its core, uh, this initiative, which I uh, summarize or, or abbreviate as, as CHEP, Community Health and Economic Prosperity, hopes to galvanize business investment in community health, recognizing that as communities prosper, so do businesses. And, uh, any of you all heard of this little startup company called Amazon? Small little, small little internet company. Well, uh, a lot of the big debate over the last year or so was where were they going to put their second headquarters. And where did they end up? They ended up in Crystal City, Virginia. And you may not realize this, but four of the top 20 healthiest cities in the United States surround Crystal City, Virginia. It's not a coincidence that Amazon ended up there. We know that as communities prosper, so too to businesses. And we need to recognize that healthy communities full of healthy people are necessary to support and to sustain prosperous businesses as employees and as consumers. Uh, another story I'll tell you is about when I met a gentleman from General Motors. And uh, I often tell people that healthcare is the number two expense for most Fortune 500 companies. This gentleman from General Motors stopped me. He said, no, you're wrong. When you talk about General Motors, we spend more for health care than we do for any other component of a vehicle. You're paying more for health care than you're paying for steel when you buy a General Motors car. And that's not a way you build a sustainable business. So CHEP is all about engaging businesses and implementing solutions and strengthening communities so that everybody in that stakeholder equation benefits. The business climate improves, economic opportunity for everyone improves, community connectedness improves, Health improves, and these things continue in a virtuous upward cycle. Uh, any of you read the book Dreamland by uh, Frank Quinones? Dreamland talks about the cycle going in the wrong direction, and we've seen this in too many communities across America. We don't invest in health. Um, people succumb to, uh, to substance use disorder. Uh, people leave town. You have fewer people to work, fewer people to buy products, the local restaurants close because nobody's shopping there anymore, the local businesses go out of business, and then people become even more unhealthy because they can't, uh, they, they have no longer have employer provided insurance. We don't want that, that downward cycle. We want that virtuous upward cycle. And uh, as a former state health officer, um, I'm not just speaking to the business uh, community out there today. I'm also calling out my uh, public health partners as critical in creating healthy and vibrant communities. Because we aren't always the best partners, and we often don't speak to our audience. Uh, and uh, we need to realize that the fact is, uh, people don't typically vote on or prioritize health. And that may seem shocking for me to say to you as Surgeon General of the United States, but you don't even prioritize health in your day-to-day -day life relative to your work. And uh, some of you may, you may be shaking your heads um, when I say that, but I'll ask you this. Raise your hand if sometime in the past week, for the sake of your job, you've skipped a meal, you've eaten an unhealthy meal, you've missed time with your family, you've failed to work out. And those of you who haven't raised your hand, most of you are lying out there. It's too early in the morning for that, people. And the fact is, each and every one of us makes decisions that we know are not the best for our health for the sake of our jobs. And this is reflected in Gallup polls. Number one issue people vote on, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rural or urban, is jobs in the economy consistently. So we need to speak to people in a way that resonates and not in a way that we typically like to, to, to talk about. 
How many of you all are, are from the health or healthcare or medical fields out there? So enough people out here that you'll, you'll get this. I was at the US Conference of Mayors, and I had mayors from all around the country sitting around a table. And I wanted to know what made them tick, because one of my roles as a public health advocate is to try to get those mayors to invest in health. And uh, so I asked these, um, these mayors, how many of you all ran for office on a pledge to lower your community's hemoglobin A1C rates by 15%. <laughs> and for the health folks out there, for the non-health folks out there, hemoglobin A1C is the way we measure your blood sugar if you've got, uh, your, your blood sugar readings if you've got diabetes. And uh, guess what? Not a single mayor raised their hand. They don't run on lowering hemoglobin A1C rates in communities. But many of the mayors in that room had created walkable communities, communities that uh, the governor talked about yesterday. And uh, so I asked them, well, why'd you create a walkable community if not to lower hemoglobin A1C rates? And they said, we created walkable communities because we know walkable communities drive more foot traffic downtown and increase business revenue. And we collect more taxes, and then we can use that money to reinvest back into our communities. Walkable communities drive up property values, so your home is worth more. And then you want to spend more to, to, to put into your home so that the value continues to go up in a virtuous upward cycle. We in the health and public health communities need to understand what drives people to act so that we can, again, speak to our audience and get them to work with us. In public health, we've got some valuable assets. We've got data. We've got local knowledge. We have trust in the community. And we have a track record of improving health. But we've got to show people how what we're offering will help them achieve the goals that they want to achieve. So we've got to engage with businesses, with planning, with community development and economic development as part of growing capacity. Uh, we need to really seek to embed health in all policies. This is something that some of you may have heard about, we often talk about. Uh, I think of it in a different way. Um, I'm a big fan of health and all policies, but again, we can't approach it from the uh, point of view uh, of trying to force health into other people's priorities. We need to show them how health can help them in all of their policies. How thinking about health will create a prosperous community, a safer community, a more vibrant community. And we know businesses need a healthy, educated workforce. I know you feel that keenly here in North Dakota. Our communities shape not only the health, but the educational attainment of our residents. It may be the determining factor in whether our young people create opportunity or pursue it elsewhere. You've got lots of young folks sitting here in the audience. Those young folks have a decision to make. Are they going to stay here in North Dakota and be part of rebuilding and lifting up the communities that they grew up in? Or are they going to get out of here the first chance they get? And even amongst the group of young people back there, it's probably split about 50-50 in terms of where, what they're thinking right now. We need to invest in communities and make them places that these young people want to stay in. And my CHEP initiative reminds us that community health, and I'm not just talking about health in the traditional sense, I'm talking about um, well, good paying jobs, I'm talking about green spaces, I'm talking about um, an array of different uh, businesses and restaurants and, and things that they find attractive. That's essential to the health of your state. We know where you live shapes how you live and shapes the opportunities available to you and your children. These young folks out there want to live in a place that's going to be a place they'd be proud to raise their kids. Uh, we know the quality of your environment inf influences the quality of your health your life expectancy, and what illnesses you develop. Uh, it's unfortunate on some of the reservations around here, the life expectancy is under 60 years of age. Under 60. Is that a community where most folks would want to raise their kids? We've got to do better. And we know when we all work together, we're making an investment in not just health, but in our people, our places, our businesses, in our collective futures. Uh, I want to give you a couple of examples because uh, I think it's important to, to know that there are communities out there that are doing this. It's not just saying it as a pie in the sky theoretical idea, but uh, we want to help you understand how to mobilize businesses as change agents investing in communities. And that could mean 
thinking about ways you can contribute to solving the opioid epidemic. I visited with uh, Second Lady Pence, uh, Belden Industries in Indiana. Through their Pathways to Recovery program, they actually realized that they were having to interview upwards of 200 people to fill about 20 positions because they couldn't find enough people who could pass the drug test. And uh, that's not a sustainable business model. So what did they do? Uh, they instituted a Pathways to Recovery program where they would drug test people or ask them if they had been uh, using substances right away instead of waiting until they did the first interview and then the second interview and then got hired and then failed the drug test. And uh, if they said that they needed help or they failed the drug test, they offered them treatment. And if they were successful in treatment, they saved a job for them. And the people who complete this program are among Belden's best, hardest working, most loyal employees. They actually miss less work than people who hadn't been through the program and who never had a substance use disorder. So the fact is, it's not just good for the community what Belden's doing, it's good for their business. And uh, it could also mean addressing tobacco use, the way the Chamber of Commerce in Kansas City did with Tobacco 21. Because again, we know the number two expense for most companies is healthcare, and the biggest driver of those healthcare expenses is high utilization of tobacco. It could mean offering generous paid maternity and paternity and family leave, the way American Express does. You know why they do it? Because when they offer generous paternity and maternity leave, they become an employer of destination. And people want to come and work for them. And they want to stay with that company for 10, 20, 30 years. Again, it's good for the person. It's also good for business. Uh, another example involves uh, food labs in Detroit. Uh, they built up a, 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 a culture of female entrepreneurship around the urban gardens that exist in that community, using a local asset to build capacity and provide more jobs, more locally owned businesses, again, good for business, and a, a healthier environment, more access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So CHEP is about returning value to businesses for investing in communities in ways that improve health. And that value can take many forms. It can deliver a health, healthier population and lower health care costs, it can deliver healthier workers who are more productive and more loyal. It can deliver increased value to the brand as consumers and customers approve of a business plan's values and principles. And you saw Yahoo do this when they talked about increasing the amount of leave that they offered. That was a branding strategy as much as it was a strategy to uh, help health. And value can be just plain old money. If a business joins a venture to build lower mixed income housing, that investment can turn into a profit. So I hope to convince businesses, many of you all here in the audience, that uh, the well-being of the community is good for your business. Not in place of government, and that's a question I often get too. I'm not saying government doesn't have a role, but uh, we all have to do our part and encourage government to do their part as well as doing our own part in communities. And uh, I was talking with, the, uh, with your governor last night. Businesses can get involved in policy and advocacy. Uh, the fact is, I'd rather have the owner of your, of your largest business in town arguing for a health initiative than to have your state health officer arguing for it in front of the legislature. And uh, that's no offense to, uh, to my Lynn, because she's a good friend of mine. But uh, I'll tell you a quick story about what happened when I was in my Lynn's role in Indiana. We were trying to raise the tobacco tax in our state because we have some of the lowest tobacco taxes in the country. High smoking rates, uh, high health care costs, people dying every day um, from, from tobacco use. And we had about two hours of experts lined up at the state legislature to talk about the, uh, the harms of tobacco usage. And they talked, and they talked, and they talked. And uh, at the end of that two hours, we had about 15 minutes of testimony from the business community, the gas stations, the casinos, and the mom and pop bars. And they showed up and they didn't deny any of the health claims that we made. They said, if you raise the tobacco taxes, it's going to be bad for our business and we're going to lose jobs. And the legislature said, we've heard enough. We're going to table this issue. Uh, we're not going to talk about it anymore. 
And uh, I think that really goes to, to drive home the point that we need businesses engaged in policy because if I get to do this all over again, I'm not gonna bring more health people to the table to drone on. I wanna bring b bigger businesses to the table and have them explain to the legislature that tobacco usage is actually bad for our business. That people who smoke are more likely to miss work. That people who smoke are more likely to have children who miss school and have to stay home with them. That they're more likely to develop cardiovascular disease and cancer and drive up healthcare costs. And uh, we call this investment in communities the zip code, zip code growing business. You've probably heard that a person's zip code is more important than their genetic code in determining their health. If we want that not to be the case, if we want all zip codes to be supportive of good health and prosperity, then we have to improve a lot of zip codes. I don't want those young people in the back of the room all moving to Crystal City, Virginia to go work for Amazon there. I want them to stay here in North Dakota. And businesses can and should be in the zip code improving business, paying a living wage, reducing the gap between the highest and lowest paid employees, paying sick leave and paternal leave. These are all things that businesses can pretty much do on their own. I want to close with just a couple more examples because I want to make sure we save time for questions. Uh, I've been to some really neat places around the country that are again working through these public-private partnerships that you heard the governor talk about. In Oklahoma City, for example, they had a problem. They had two to three times more people in their jail than the jail was built for. They were actually being sued by the federal government for jail overcrowding. And the sheriff wanted business support to advocate for a new, bigger jail, because that's the problem, right? That's the solution to the problem. When business leaders learned about the issue, they pointed out the fact that, hey, we can't be sustainable, vibrant businesses if one out of every five people in the community is in jail. And if you're using our tax revenue that we're generating to build bigger and bigger jails, overcrowded jails aren't good for business. So uh, they joined in an initiative to uh, help, help reform their criminal justice laws. They, and that was led by the business community. And the jail is now down to its intended capacity. The stakeholders they put together from judges and police officers to school teachers and superintendents to philanthropists and concerned citizens is making progress. And again, that's good for health, it's good for social justice, and it's good for business. We've got some tribal folks in the audience today. I visited Chickasaw Nation um, down in, uh, in southern Oklahoma. And we know they don't collect income taxes and generally don't levy sales taxes, so they don't have a base of money to work from. But they chose to invest in businesses, a chocolate company, broadband, water treatment. And uh, not only did they work to make those businesses successful, but they reinvested the profits back into health in the community. Because they know the only way for their businesses to thrive is if their communities thrive. And that's one of the basic tenets of CHEP. You can't have one without the other for a long. You can't have health without healthy businesses, and you can't have healthy businesses without health. My last example, because young people are in the crowd, is about opportunity use. And I was in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where about one in seven young people aged 16 to 24 aren't in school and aren't employed. So some people call them disconnected use. I like to call them opportunity use because it's a missed opportunity for our businesses out there. That's the workforce we're trying to employ here in North Dakota. And these young people, when they're not connected, when they aren't realizing their opportunity, they can develop a host of problems that then we have to pay for in society, from an excess of chronic diseases and mental health issues, to incarceration, to drawing unemployment, to being homeless. Uh, and again, it all comes back to our failure to connect them with society. The full fiscal burden of youth who are disconnected from education and employment is estimated to be about 1.6 trillion with a T dollars in this country. So let me tell you about two businesses that are working to really turn these disconnected youth into opportunity use, Hyatt and Bank of America. Both companies have jobs that don't require a college degree or even a high school diploma. And uh, they looked at the way they were hiring people and said, gosh, why do we have a 
a college diploma, a co college degree as a prerequisite for even interviewing for this job. They developed workforce and training programs to help connect with people in high school and in middle school and to give them confidence and to give them the skills they would need to become successful employees. And working with local, regional, and national nonprofits like Grads of Life, they're now hiring thousands of these opportunity youth and providing training and mentoring and creating career ladders. These companies have found that their opportunity youth are terrific employees among their most loyal. They're more likely to stay longer with the company and they offer a great savings on the typical retirement cost to fill entry level or higher positions. Hyatt and Bank of America have made a solid business investment in these youth because again, good health is good business. These kinds of business decisions are investments, investments in people and communities that lift up those who are struggling. So I wanna leave you with some calls for action and then we'll take some questions. My CHEP initiative is focused on the things businesses can do for communities that both strengthen communities and are in the self-interest of the businesses. And it's about the things the, the communities can do to lift up those businesses. So we've got to ask, what can communities do to create a better business environment? How can you build healthy, vibrant communities that will support and nurture businesses and create prosperity for all? And I can tell by the way you talk about the Main Street Initiative that you're influenced by the organization Strong Towns. You heard the uh, governor talk about that. Uh, I saw Strong Towns president, Chuck Marone, was a keynote speaker just yesterday. Him, how, how many of you all heard Chuck yesterday? Well, here are a few calls to action out of the Strong Towns playbook. Number one, focus on incremental change. It can seem overwhelming. And I grew up in a rural area. I grew up in a town that didn't seem like it had lots of opportunity. It can seem overwhelming trying to figure out how you're going to reshape your town, but focus on incremental change. Cities and towns often spend a lot of effort trying to attract businesses to their location, but instead, how about trying, instead of luring a company to provide 50 jobs, why not help your existing businesses add one or two jobs each? Start there. Um, Strong Towns talks about economic gardening, so instead of focusing on creating jobs, focusing on creating places that foster job creation. We talked about one of your struggles being finding young people to fill the jobs that are created. So investing in entrepreneurs, we know helps young people see their future here instead of someplace else. They wanna be business owners one day. They wanna control their own destiny. It helps to have young people who are engaged, like the opportunity youth who I mentioned. When you've got lots of job vacancies, and you're trying to recruit workers, you wanna make the most of the young people you already have here. And again, health and all policies is something that takes teamwork. We need the folks who aren't in the health arena to think about inviting the health folks to their table. We need the health people to be willing to go to that table and be humble and listen and try to figure out how your tools can help people achieve their goals and not just lower hemoglobin A1Cs. So tend to your economic garden, build strong and resilient communities, and think about the health implications of every step that you take. You're well on your way with the Main Street initiative that you've got going on. It truly is a national example that I'm sharing with the rest of the country. But it's gonna take every person in here committed to really turn North Dakota into the fully vibrant state that we know that it can be into a community where every single one of those young people in the audience wants to stay, into a place where health creates business prosperity and where business, priority, business prosperity in turn creates health. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you a little bit today about, again, my CHEP initiative and how it intersects with the work you're doing. Thank you for inviting me out here. And I, uh, I gotta tell you, it is the honor of my life to serve as your United States Surgeon General, particularly at this time. The uh, First Lady mentioned my three kids. You know, what, what's, what's funny is um, she, she introduced me as Vice Ad Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Dr. Jerome Adams. I was like, wow, that's a lot of titles. But uh, my most important title is DAD, it's dad. And uh, I think 
the more we focus on leaving a better world for our children and for the youth in our communities than the world that was left for us, I think the, uh, the better this, this state will be, the better this country will be, and the better our world will be. And uh, I'm proud to be working alongside all of you to make that the case. So thank you. I yeah. think I am, right? We should. We all right, let's just, we'll jump in, but uh, fantastic to have you here. We're so, on behalf of all of us that are here, it's, uh, it's a big deal that you're in North Dakota, not just doing a flyby, two full days, uh, meeting with uh, public health officials, uh, last night meeting with, uh, with folks working on tribal health, uh, working, talking about behavioral health at dinner last night with our team. But anyway, we're so grateful for all the time that you're spending here. And he did mention the titles, but just, I know not everybody's familiar with, with military titles, but a vice admiral is a three-star equivalent. Uh, they don't get to wear the things on the shoulder of the three stars, but it's a really big deal. There's very few three stars actually in the entire United States. So anyway, he deserves all the titles. Uh, and uh, so, and, and of course, Surgeon General is a big deal. There's only one of those. There's very few three stars, uh, but I really like your focus on being, well, a, on, being a, on being a dad. I mean, uh, let's, thank let's you, give it up for that too, because that's a, uh, so cool. My, my wife tells me I should never expect her to call me Vice Admiral or Doctor <laughs> or Surgeon General at home. And I'm lucky if I get called dad by her because she's usually yelling at me for something. <laughs> but, uh, but it's because I'm on the road so much. And I, uh, you know, my, my uh, oldest son loves to fish and I told him where I was and he said, dad, how come you didn't bring me out there? They've got good fishing. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. Forget Minnesota, we got better fishing in, right. in Minnesota. But in the North uh, Dakota. What, uh, what are they with you guys in Minnesota? It seems like there's a rivalry going on there. <laughs> It's, it's kind yeah. of game over, I think. There's just, they just, they, <laughs> most of them would like to become part of North Dakota, I think, but that's. There you go. But we, we've uh, got some kind of lightning round. We've got 15 minutes. Okay. First Lady and I have some questions, so we'll go quick. But uh, so the easiest one possible, the, 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 these have touched in the news and you've made a statement on this, but of course, uh, people don't think about the flu being a dangerous, deadly disease these days, but we know that people still die of the flu, and yet there's still some controversy about, you know, vaccines, should kids get vaccines, should people get the flu vaccine? Uh, doctor, Surgeon General, Vice Admiral, should people get their flu vaccine? Absolutely, and you should get your flu vaccine because it's good for business. Do you know that the average um, county spends about $2 million a year on indirect and direct related costs due to the flu? Uh, when folks have the flu, um, you can die. You can die from the flu. But that's what folks think about as, as the, the one thing, and particularly young people, they say, ah, that's never going to happen to me. You're going to be hospitalized from the flu. That's time you miss for work. That's time you're going to miss from your family. Uh, you can get other people sick at work. You're going to be less productive if you've got the flu at work and you're in the bathroom blowing your nose every uh, five minutes or, or throwing up instead of instead of uh, working. So uh, the flu vaccine is safe, it is effective. We're working on trying to make it more effective, but it is still the, the best way to protect yourself from getting the flu this winter. And we want everyone to, we typically tell folks to get the flu before Halloween, so you don't have much time left, people, to get the flu shot. Um, but uh, I, I, I kid a little bit, ideally we want you to get it before Halloween, but uh, you can get it at any time during the year, um, uh, during the winter. Uh, well, we want you to get the flu shot so that you can build up your immunity okay. before the flu season hits its peak. Okay. And, uh, but, but we actually advise people to get their flu shots all the way through uh, January, February. So there's no wrong time to get it, but now is a very good time to get your flu shot. It'll be good for you, it's good for business. And the other thing is, uh, what's, what's horrifying to me are the numbers of, uh, of both older people and uh, young people 
who die from the flu. There's a bimodal distribution of who dies from the flu. And just because we feel like we're young and invincible, I still feel like I'm young even though I lost all my hair. Um, but uh, even though we feel like we're invincible, imagine how bad you would feel if this Thanksgiving, you're the one who gave the flu to that newborn niece or nep nephew who came over to uh, your Thanksgiving meal. Or if you were the one who gave grandma or grandpa the flu and they ended up in the intensive care unit or God forbid, passed away. We can help prevent that by getting our flu shots. Great. Uh, another one that's been in the news a lot, you and I spoke about this, but uh, tell us about, and it all lands in your office, but tell us about uh, the, all the news about vaping and what your office knows about the research and what things might be done from well, a policy well, standpoint. Thank you for that. Um, I want the young people in the crowd in particular to hear me. Um, tobacco use has been going down in young people for the last two decades. Uh, it's now going back up again because of vaping. And uh, we were able to drive it down because young people at one point thought cigarette smoking was safe and they thought that it was cool. And the cigarette industry worked hard to make people think it was safe and it was cool. Now if you ask the average young person um, if they think smoking a cigarette is cool or safe, they'll say no. But they think vaping is cool and they think it is safe, but it's not. Uh, the amount of nicotine in one jewel pod is equivalent to the amount of nicotine in an entire pack of cigarettes. An entire pack of cigarettes. So young people are coming rapidly addicted, enslaved. That is what the industry is trying to do to you guys, trying to enslave you for the rest of your lives to nicotine. Um, and we know that these substances can change your brain, can prime you to become addicted to other substances. We know that it can affect learning, attention, and memory, and can have a lifetime of consequences for you. So don't let the big tobacco companies manipulate you. Don't let them enslave you. It's not just harmless water vapor. So I put out an advisory last year. You can view it at surgeongeneral.gov, uh, talking about the rise in use e-cigarette use and the things that everyone can do in communities to, uh, to help uh, young people understand the dangers of these products and to help people who are addicted to nicotine quit. Uh, that's uh, come together in a perfect storm with the normalization of marijuana in our communities. And now we've got these vaping-related lung injury cases, the majority of which are coming from young people who are vaping THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. Uh, and uh, now we've got 34 people who've died, over 1,600 lung injury cases. Uh, my, my advice is simple. Uh, God didn't mean for anything to go into your lungs but air. And uh, if you're vaporizing an oil and then letting it come into your lungs and collect on your lung tissue, that is not a good thing. And it can cause long-term harm in addition to the, uh, to, to the addictive properties of nicotine. So young, young people in particular, um, pregnant women should not vape and shouldn't use marijuana. And I'll finish on one other quick point. I know, it, I know from, from studies and surveys that young people in particular think marijuana is less dangerous than, what it, uh, than, what it, than, than ever um, because it's been uh, legalized in some way, shape, or form in 33 states. But this is not the marijuana of 20 years ago. THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, was about 4% um, uh, content in 1995. The THC content of today's marijuana from most dispensaries is about 20 to 25 percent. And that's before you concentrate it into oils and waxes and dab it or vape it. Uh, and in that form, it can deliver 80 to 90 percent THC. So let me give you a real comparison. That is like the difference between drinking a light beer in 1995 and drinking a pint of vodka in 2019. And so uh, if someone told you it'd be okay to have a glass of wine or a light beer in 1995, but they're using that to tell you now that it's okay to drink a pint of vodka. That's apples and oranges, people. This is not your mother's marijuana, and it's got unique dangers that can cause you to become addicted. It can cause you to have other problems. So please, don't vape any substance at all. It's so great to hear you talk about, you know, sort of corporations and why they should be interested in healthy communities and people's health. And um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, of course, you know that we're focusing on eliminating stigma. And, you know, one of the things we did was, you know, we wanted to learn what is the level of stigma 
in North Dakota um, and how people view the disease of addiction. So we did a survey, the first one ever, no other state has done it, that, that is solely focused on, on determining the level of stigma. And we learned that 63% of North Dakotans believe that addiction is a disease, which I was pretty surprised by that. I thought it would be lower, but it still means that one in three people believe that addiction is a choice or a moral failing. So we are now you know, trying to focus on how do we reach those one in three people? And we've kind of come to the conclusion that you know, corporate America is a, is a great opportunity to engage business leaders and the business community in creating um, you know, supportive work environments around recovery, and as well as taking the opportunity to eliminate stigma. Um, and so I guess I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts on um, you know, how corporations might do that? Or have you come across anybody that's you know, having a be best practice related to how they approach that? There are, se there are several. I talked about Belden and their uh, Pathways to Recovery program. I really encourage you to look that up because they've done a lot of the uh, you know, legwork in creating a, a recovery-friendly yeah. workplace. Uh, another example I love is Grayston Bakeries in New York. Have you heard about Grayston? I don't think so. So Grayston knows that people who are in recovery often have challenges getting a job. Um, they've got that scarlet letter of, of uh, being an addict. Uh, you know, and, and I don't like to use that word, but, it, but that's, that's the way folks think of them. If they're, they're bad. They've got that A, that scarlet A on them, and so we don't want to hire them. Um, Grayston hires people with no background check, um, no CV, uh, they just say, if you want to work, come in and work. And their motto is, we don't hire people to bake brownies, we bake brownies to hire people. And uh, I, I just love that motto. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that the employers out there can do in a very real way is look at the, uh, the benefits that you offer. Uh, I've talked to groups of employers who all tell me that they want to help with the opioid epidemic, and I say, well, have you sat down with your uh, benefit manager? Are you paying for mental health? Um, services? Are you paying for alternatives to opioids for people who have chronic pain? Or are you still making it easier for the doctor to give them 60 Vicodin than to prescribe them physical therapy or to prescribe them some other modality? So look at the benefits that you can provide out there. And then finally, use your voice. Share your sport stories. And again, it's why I'm so proud of you. And uh, you know, when I ran for Surgeon General, or, or, or when I was nominated, uh, there were folks who told me, don't talk about your brother. That's not a story that you want to talk about. That's not a story that, that folks want to associate with their surgeon in general. That's going to hurt your chances of actually being confirmed if that comes out. And that goes back to the stigma that people face over and over again. But I think the higher up you are um, in terms of visibility, the more powerful it is when people hear you share your story. And uh, you've changed lives, not just in North Dakota, but all over America by sharing your story, so thank you for that. Thank you, and thank you for sharing as well. <clears throat> Dr. Adams, on, uh, you've been out in front on the whole opioid crisis, uh, and I think the latest, maybe you've got more current, but was it maybe 1917, 77,000 overdose deaths in America. Uh, you know, record number just climbing up. Uh, you, you've been out in front sort of paving the way on reducing stigma, but you also were really out there on, on getting people to carry naloxone. Yes. And, and of course, I think, we'd love to have you share that, and I think then the First Lady, too, to share uh, our experience here in North Dakota, but talk a little bit about uh, the tie between erasing stigma and actually saving lives. Well, there's a person dying of an opioid overdose every 11 minutes in this country. And again, there's a stigma attached to people who are, who are overdosing. Uh, over half the people who are overdosing are overdosing in homes, in bedrooms, in bathrooms, in garages. They're not overdosing in alleys. Uh, this, the face of addiction is not uh, what you tend to think of, and we all have an opportunity to save a life. So I'll tell you from a medical point of view, it takes about four to five minutes to die from anoxic brain injury because when you overdose, you stop breathing, you don't get oxygen to your brain, and then you die. Well, uh, anyone know of an ambulance in North Dakota that can get to your house in four to six minutes? And that's not just North Dakota, that's most places in the country. You can't get EMS there in that amount of time. 
So if we're really going to turn around overdose rates in our country, we need more and more people to be willing to carry naloxone, which is an opioid overdose reversal agent that is easy to administer, it's safe, it's not going to hurt the person if they aren't having an overdose, and it's available in most pharmacies and most insurers will pay for it. So uh, the communities that I've seen that have been able to turn around their opioid overdose rates have really embraced naloxone and helped encourage more people in their communities to carry it, as you all have done here in North Dakota. And it is why, over the past year, we've seen your overdose rates go down. Because you can't get someone into recovery if they're dead. And I hate to be so, so blunt or so crass about it, but the first step to recovery for so many people is saving that life and then connecting them to treatment. That's so true. And, you know, three years ago, when we had our first Recovery Reinvented event, you know, we have a really innovative and, you know, progressive behavioral health team. And they said, you know, let's distribute Narcan, mm -hmm. um, Naloxone, at the event, uh, which was, you know, maybe a little controversial even at the time. So we distributed it and trained people. And then um, five days after the event, parents found their son overdosed on their bathroom floor and they revived him with the Narcan, which was, you know, incredible. And then last week I was uh, at MHA Nation and two of the women that I was talking to there um, who had been at Recovery Re Reinvented told me that they had used the Narcan that they had gotten at that event to, you know, re to revive two people. So that's three lives really saved because of Narcan and, you know, and so it's so important um, and we are certainly all in in our state as well um, about the importance of carrying that. No. Wonderful. Dennis, are you out there? What's that? Do you have my naloxone, Dennis? <laughs> I carry it with me everywhere I go. and um, I don't, I don't, I He's can't in the think. back, I no. think, back there. Okay. I saw him raise his hand. If yep. you have it, and if you have, have the naloxone, can you bring it up so we can show folks? Um, any other? Uh, well, young, we, how many people out there are in high school or middle school? I got some high schoolers and middle schoolers. Any of you all want to ask the uh, governor or the first lady or the surgeon general a tough question? We got <laughs> a minute or two left. First hand up gets to ask a tough question. Right there, young lady. Uh, you, you right there in the middle. Uh, That's not a student. There's one over here to the left. There's a student over here. Oh, she, stand up and come up here. Because, so, and Thank you. There's one to the left, too. He sees her down there, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yay. Good, good job. I'm going to jump down so we can hear your question on my microphone. What's your name? Kaylin. Hi, Kaylin. So what's your question? Why do you think there's such a large, large opioid crisis in these past few years? That's a great question. Why don't you great all question. take that while I come up there? And thank you so much. Everyone give Kaylin a round of applause for coming up. <laughs> well, the opioid crisis. So a, a big part of the reason for the opioid crisis was actually started in the early 90s when pain management became a fifth vital sign. So um, every time you went to a doctor, he would say, what's your level of pain? And then, then they would gauge that. And then reimbursements um, became, uh, for hospitals and physicians, um, were tied to uh, the level of pain management and, um, and reviews. And so, you know, if a, if a patient didn't feel like they were getting treated well enough on pain management, then the, the doctor or the hospital wouldn't get a reimbursement or the full reimbursement. And that, and that really started it as well as the manufacturing of Oxycontin, mm -hmm. which um, was at the time deemed to be non-addictive, non um, which is, was totally not true, and sort of it just snowballed from there. I mean, that's my... Yep, non-addictive, safe. That book, Dreamland, um, effective. does a really good job of describing it, right? The it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it. And what scares me is a lot of the rhetoric that you, you heard about um, opioids, prescription opioids 20 years ago, is the same rhetoric that we're hearing people use in regards to marijuana now. It's safe, it's effective, it's not addictive, it's not gonna hurt you. It's good for, for whatever ails you, uh, from, from anything to, uh, from to menstrual cramps to PTSD to, uh, to anxiety to, uh, to back pain, it's gonna fix everything. And um, it's not to say that I dismiss the uh, potential medicinal benefits of uh, components of marijuana, but there's no other medicine that we as doctors tell people to grow in your backyard and to uh, roll up into a joint and smoke. And that's my prescription for you, for what ails you. But you mentioned pain, and I think that's critically important. And it's a great note to end on, because uh, uh, there is a lot of pain that exists 
in our community. There's emotional pain, there's mental pain, uh, there's physical pain, and folks like my brother seek to self-medicate away their pain when we don't create resilient communities. Um, they seek, uh, I, I, I said this to the uh, governor yesterday, unfortunately, everyone out there, no, not unfortunately, uh, we're all wired to get high. Everyone wants to get high. Some of us get high on hanging out with family. Some of us get high on going out and hunting. Some of us get high on, 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 on skating or playing hockey or, or going for a run or a bike. Um, we need to find more opportunities to provide those positive ways for people to get high, to get that dopamine surge that, uh, that everyone craves and not these negative ways that exist out there. And folks are gonna continue to self-medicate and we're gonna continue to play whack-a-mole from opioids to meth to whatever it is if we don't address the lack of resiliency in our communities, which is what your Main Street initiative is all about. Yes, in closing stat, Vice Admiral, U.S. has 5% of the population. What percentage of the opioids? 5% of the population, but we prescribe over 90% of the world's opioids. So we, we aren't going to turn things around with numbers like that. I want to show you the, the naloxone really quickly. This is what it looks like in the package. There are two take-home versions. One is the uh, injectable version. This trainer can take two inject. Place black end against outside. It's that easy to use the injectable version. And watch, I'll even, I hope Secret Service doesn't get me. See, <laughs> that easy to, uh, to save a life with the injectable version. And this is the intranasal version. And this, uh, so we're gonna finish really quickly by going through how you can save a life. So you come across someone and you suspect that they may have had an overdose. How would you know if they're having an overdose? Well, they uh, may not be breathing. They may be non-responsive. They may have blue lips. In many cases, you will find drug paraphernalia around them because fentanyl and carfentanyl work so fast uh, that in many cases, we find people with a needle still in their arm having overdosed. But those are signs of an overdose, non-responsiveness, not breathing, blue lips. Uh, and so the first thing you wanna do is try to stimulate them. And so you can do what we call a sternal rub, put your knuckles like this and rub it across their chest, or just shake them vigorously to see if they come around. If they don't come around, uh, then you should have someone call 911 immediately, um, regardless of whether or not you have naloxone. And then if you have naloxone, then you can put it in their nostril and press. And it is literally that easy to save a life. But always call naloxone because again, with uh, these new super potent narcotics out there, fentanyl and carfentanyl, one dose of naloxone may be enough to, uh, get, to encourage them to take a few more breaths but it's not gonna return them back to normal. Or they may uh, return to normal for five, 10 minutes, and then that super potent opioid then comes back and, uh, and they stop breathing again. So always call 911, but you can save a life with naloxone. And thank you both for your work, not only to lift up the health and prosperity of communities, but also to respond to the opioid epidemic and to lower stigma. Thank you. Thank you so much. give it up for the Let's Surgeon General. Thank you. We're gonna do We're gonna get selfie with the crowd. All right, here we go. Okay, everybody, smile. Fantastic. Yay. Yay. All right. Please welcome North Dakota Commerce Commissioner Michelle Comer to the stage. All right. Well, thank you so much, Surgeon General, Vice Admiral, Dr. Jerome Adams, for that inspirational wisdom. We're very grateful. I'm Michelle Comer. I'm the Commerce Commissioner. I needed help here today. This is Keith. This is Devin. They are from Rugby High School. Please say hi. I'll explain why, why they're here in just a moment. Um, before we go into the break, I want to tell you about some of the exciting things that this day holds. Last night in the marketplace, I got some pickles, some beets, 
some healthy water, some cheesecake, some coffee, took some photos. All of that stuff and, and more is available over there for you today. There are more than 70 engaging booths with local artists, artis, artisans, state agencies, information about resources and partner organizations. I will be urging you to head over there all throughout the day. Um, as I mentioned, um, I brought my friends, my new friends, Keith and Devin, and um, we are really, excited because we're able to offer um, continuing education credits for those of you that are medical or healthcare professionals. So uh, please raise your hand if you are a medical or healthcare professional here today. All right, awesome, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. So Keith and Devin are going to help me with some special instructions for you. Are you guys ready? All right, at your tables, you have a pretest. It looks like this. Thank you very much. You have a post-test. It looks like that. You also have an evaluation that looks like this. So we need you to complete the pretest and the post-test and the evaluation. You can turn that information into the registration desk before you leave today. I also want to read some important information to you. Yesterday we established that I am a fast talker and I'm going to beat my record that was set yesterday. So are you ready? For today's program, Dr. Adams has indicated that he does not have a commercial support relationship. The presentation did and will not include discussion of commercial products and services. The presentation did not include discussion of commercial products and services and will not and did not include discussion of trade names. The providing units, UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences, North Dakota Department of Health, North Dakota Department of Commerce, and AARP have indicated no commercial supportive relationships. There will be no mention of off-label or investigative usage of products or services, and there will be no discussion of trade names from their perspective. The planning committee has has indicated no commercial support relationship exists. All right, awesome. Now, as has been mentioned throughout the morning, we have students here today. So if you would please stand up, if you are a student like Keith and Devin, please stand up. And I would also like the teachers to stand up, the teachers that escorted these students here today. And please remain standing because I have a few words for you. First of all, I want to thank the teachers here, but more important than me thanking you are your students thanking you. So students, I am talking to you. Before you leave for the day, will you please express gratitude to your teachers for the work that they do? And let's all do that now. <laughs> Stay standing, students. I want you to know that the Main Street Initiative honors your voice. If you seek purpose and you want to make a difference, you live in the right state. Community leaders, if you want to know what will make the most difference in your community, these are the people that you should ask. So thank you for being here today, students. You can sit down. All right. There are a lot of people here today. Some sessions may even be standing room only, so get there quick and have a backup plan. And finally, please enjoy the networking break that you're about to experience. Go to the Main Street Marketplace and then head to your breakout sessions. Thanks again for being here. Thanks, Keith and Devin. Have a great next session and we'll see you back here for lunch. <laughs>